and it looks like we are recording. Hey, hello, welcome to today's painting lesson. Together, we are going to endeavor into a warm, serene summer piece with a really relaxed atmosphere. And of course, as per usual, it will be in real time. That said, let me tell you about some exciting resources up over on the Patreon page, which will help make the drawing and painting process a lot easier. As a patron, you will get access to the traceables for these lessons, which will make it so you don't have to worry about getting your proportions or perspective right by yourself. Additionally, you can find my ebooks covering composition, color palettes, glazing, brushes, as well as just about everything you need to know about acrylic painting. Also, there are over a hundred bonus lessons up over on Patreon that you can't find here on YouTube. And you can also get personalized art critiques from me so you can get feedback on your work while continuing to improve your techniques. There are a lot of great resources up there. I do recommend checking it out. And with that, now we are going to jump into the lesson. It is a long one. It is a fulfilling one. And I think there are a lot of great little lessons within it. So let's relax, enjoy, and stay creative together. We're going to begin here today with a one inch flat headed brush, which we will dip the bottom third of it into a little bit of water, then proceed to wipe off the excess just to help keep our paint wet for a little bit longer. With that, we'll grab an abundance of titanium white and a hint of our cadmium yellow medium hue, as well as a hint of our cadmium red. And the goal here is to just render a nice bright warm yellow, which we're going to apply right where our sun will be. Now we can also work on the reflection at the same time. Use these paints multiple ways. From there, I'm going to interject some cadmium yellow deep hue, so it's a little bit warmer. If you don't have this, you can just interject a little bit of extra cadmium red into the mixture, and that will do a good job as well but I'm going to start applying this on the left and right hand sides of our initial application. We might have to mix a bit more of it and that's okay. We'll also put it on top and on the bottom. Once we have all of that applied, I'm going to start the blend and that's just very softly working over the edges, applying very minimal pressure. The more pressure we add, the more strokes and streaks we add, which we're trying to avoid for the most part. From there, as we expand outwards, we are going to interject more warmth. So that means added red, and maybe to make things easy, a little bit more of that cadmium yellow. We're using the extra titanium white to lift the pigment won't be as saturated and that's actually a good thing. I think often when a lot of us paint sunsets, we opt for very saturated hues initially, but the longer you paint, the more you realize the value and the subtlety. And the titanium white is helping with that. So once I have it around the edges, yet again, I go for those soft blends. And I don't blend it as I apply it to the canvas, because if we applied it here, then my brush would have both this color and this color when I moved over here, and it would just make it a bit more messy, a bit harder to handle. So we're just going to continue to work our way out from that central point. Yet again, we'll go warmer, cad red, cad yellow deep hue, or just more cad red if you're only working with a singular yellow. And you can see that every time to step in that warmer direction. However, I am going to essentially stop getting the top and the bottom here. So now we're just at the point where we are on the sides. Interject slightly more of that pigment. Go in for that blend. My brush strokes were very, weren't as subtle here as they could have been. So we can just soften that with less pressure. And this is all still somewhat wet because our brush is damp. Remember how we dipped it in the water initially? That's how we're keeping this a bit more of a malleable pigment. 
Now from there to complete our edges, we're just going to take some extra CAD red, make this nice, almost pink hue. And it's becoming pink because we have a lot of titanium white in the mix, which is overpowering the yellow that we have in the mix. If the yellow and the red go together, they make an orange. If the red and the white do, then we get more of a pink. This is only our first layer. It's not going to be perfect. It might be a little rough. I can tell that my pigments are starting to dry just a little bit. That's okay though. We can always grab a bit more water on our brush and do a wet into dry blend, like so. It's when the bottom layer is dry, the new layer is wet, and you still get a fairly soft transition between the two. Now I'm going to start moving up in the canvas. So we'll grab a lot of that titanium white, maybe a hint of our Mars black, just a hint. You can barely see it on the brush. It'll give us a more gray version of that which we're using, which I'll apply all the way across the top. And then we'll do our blend downwards. A lot of our blends have been happening in an arch or to the left and right. Here, however, it is downward. And now for the first time, we'll grab some ultramarine blue, work that in there as well. And I think we want this to be a little bit brighter. Some more titanium white, more ultramarine blue. Ultramarine blue is a great pigment to use here because it's a warm blue. There are cool blues like cerulean blue, and then there are warm blues like ultramarine. And ultramarine blue is a great pigment for sunsets because sunsets are inherently warm. And this value is much better. We wanted it to be a bit brighter. Doing a soft blend down. I'm trying to keep my hand out of the way, but <laughs> you can only do so much. and make a very watery mix. That way I can bring this down and just make it feel really nice and natural. Now admittedly, a lot of this looks pretty messy at this point, that is okay. That's because it's only layer number one. We're going to start layer number two. So starting with titanium white, a lot of it, a little bit of our CAD yellows, both of which. Apply that right in that central area we began in before. Doing that on the top and bottom. Just making it nice and bright. You can see the edges are still fairly rough. That's okay. Now we interject more of that CAD yellow. Work that along the edges. Do that subtle blend. Back to our CAD yellow. Hint of our CAD red. You can see how much quicker it is this time than it was last. Because we know what we're doing. We're practiced. We've already mixed those paints. And our second layer is often going to look so much better than our first. The acrylics are very thin, naturally especially when we're working with our hues. And the first layer will often look quite awkward just because of that. Need to do layers with acrylics. The more layers we add, often the better it'll look. So we're slowly just making this into more of a reddish orange. A lot of titanium white. Perfect. And you can do two, three, four layers, really until you get it the way you want it to, until it's nice and thick. And I think we'll go a bit more yellow as we lift up, actually.
Yet again, a little bit brighter. And with almost just a watery mix, I'll bring that up over the blue. Blue and yellow can look a little green, but we have the red in there. We have the pink, so I think it should work quite well. Okay, now we'll just grab a little bit more of that blue. Same mixture that we did before, but we're going to make our brush quite damp because we're doing a wet into dry blend. I'm just reinstigating that mix at the very top, in the middle, and then doing a soft blend down, not doing much. Just minor additions. And we can also add a hint of red to make it slightly more purple, which will fit with the general aesthetic of the painting well. We'll work that out extensively. A little bit more titanium white. Then we'll apply that to the top. And acrylics dry slightly darker than when they're applied, so this will look a little bit darker. From there, we're going to switch to our filbert brush, which is great because it has these rounded corners for blending, makes it really soft. We also have this sharper edge that we can use for detail work, and it can carry a good amount of paint. Very versatile brush. So I'll make sure that's nice and damp. We'll grab our titanium white, a little bit of that cad yellow medium hue, not much. Want this predominantly to be titanium white. We just want that hint of warmth. And then we can work in our sun. And I don't want it to be too distinct. I want it to be incredibly subtle, almost as if it's getting lost in the sky. And then the reflection, I'm going to do a bit of a drag down with it, like so. And then I'll use the corners of this brush, the edges, do a little blend right through there. There we go. Got that beautiful light working its way down the water. Now, from here, we're going to take a step back and we're going to work on the horizon, which is trees in the distance. It is silhouetted, so they're going to look a lot darker than they would naturally present. And because we have all of these different colors in the background, they're not going to present as a green, as we would assume. Instead, it'll have more of a mix of these hues because of the reflective light. So, from there, we're going to grab some of our ultramarine blue, a little bit of our cadmium red, mix those into a nice purple. We'll grab some Mars black, just a hint, we don't want much, a little bit of titanium white. And the goal here, we do need quite a bit of paint, is to mix a fairly desaturated purple initially. And then we can build the saturation until we feel like it's appropriate for the painting. And the white and the black will make it desaturated for us. So from there we just re-interject our two hues, the cad red and the ultramarine blue, until we get something that looks like this. It's a purple, but it's not too dramatic. I'm going to switch to my smaller flat-headed brush. It's a little bit different from the filbert brush because it has sharp corners, which are great for rendering detail, but it can also deliver a good amount of pigment with ease. So what I'm going to do is I'm just going to take my brush and I'm going to tap the implication of trees up at the top here. And that just means little pitter patters with my brush. We're just using the corner to deliver them because it is the smallest point on the brush. It's acting almost like a liner brush or a rigger brush. 
and it's going to look really dramatic here in the middle. I'll get you a bit closer though. By the way, if you're new to the channel, I do try to sometimes keep the camera close, sometimes keep it farther away, and that's so you can see how detail work is done, but you don't lose sight of the larger painting. It's so easy to get lost in the details and render a fantastic subject that just doesn't fit with the rest of the painting. And by stepping back, getting those wider shots, we can look at it as a whole and make sure that it comes together naturally. So that's why we do that. But I also think it's important to get close for the details of the strokes. So, hopefully you enjoy that extra little feature to these lessons. You can see that I'm going over portions multiple times because they are acrylics, they are thin, and we do need layers. Once I have the entirety of the top, I'll start doing a little bit of a drag down, adding extra pigment, and at this point, I'm fine to create just a a line. You can see that the bottom isn't yet applied. We're taking it slow, piece by piece. Don't need to get ahead of ourselves. It's also worth noting that the trees protrude more on the left hand side and on the right hand side than they do in the middle. By making them smaller and these markings smaller in the middle, we make it look like this edge and this edge are closer to us and then it goes inwards for the land and then it comes back outwards. So it just creates this added subtle bit of depth that we wouldn't have if we just made it the same texture, the same protrusions all the way across. So little techniques you can add to just make the painting slightly more interesting. Almost done with getting these top half trees done. Yet again, pulling back just so we can see it as a whole. Now I'm going to try to mirror, to the best of my ability, the designs that we have at the top. So all of those little protrusions. And there's an exception so that this won't be perfect. However, we're going to try to do our best. And we're also going to recognize that it's a reflection. Reflections are often somewhat different from the actual subject to a point, and that's okay. My first layer is going to be thin. We'll likely need to go over it again. That's also okay. Also, a little trick for painting reflections in general. You don't need to do it here because we're painting what looks like a relatively abstract subject anyway in these silhouetted trees. But in general, if you're painting a, a face or something that has more structure, reflection of an animal, if you turn your canvas upside down, you'll stop looking at the subject as a person or as an animal or whatever you're trying to mirror, and you'll just start seeing the shapes instead. And that'll help you articulate what shapes are there to render the best reflection. It's just a little easy trick. Painting in a mirror can also help, where you look at the mirror as you paint. The mirror is on the painting, though. <laughs> I suppose I should clarify. That said, if you do want help with the general drawing process of any of this, the traceable is up over on Patreon. So you can just copy it using a mini projector or tracing paper or really however you want to do so. Right now the top layer is fully dry, so I'm just going back up, doing a second application, making sure that that's nice and thick. Trying to be careful around my edges, because when I go over things multiple times, it's easy to expand on the initial subject, make it larger than it was, which isn't the goal right now. Right now I'm just trying to add a little bit more paint to thin portions of the canvas. There we go. If the reflection's a little thin, that also isn't a bad thing, because it means you can see the colors through it. It's a bit more interesting, but we can also cover it up as well. 
I think I want a middle ground where portions of it are covered and opaque, and some portions are a little bit more transparent. So there is a middle ground, and I think that can be great too. Well, then we get closer, we can see all of those transparent mixings. And I do want to show you that you can also just take a little bit of that purple, a little bit of that cad yellow, titanium white, makes it quite muted, almost a little bit more of a brown, but it can also be a great pigment for the reflection, particularly towards the sun, and then it can dissipate and become darker as you move towards the left and right hand side. Just a nice little subtlety. A lot of these paintings are made up of real subtlety, right? It's not a big bold stroke that does it. It's not some random pop of color. It's all of the micro decisions that we make along the way. That's what really builds their painting. Makes it special. Makes it great. You might also, we'll just test this here together, make a bit of a warmer hue. Like so. If we don't like this, we can just paint over it with a darker hue again. You can, you can watch me do it first before you commit to it. But I'm just making the trees right under the sun a little bit warmer. It's not this way in my reference photo which, by the way, is also up on Patreon, if you happen to support the channel there. But I think it can be a nice addition, and it just shows that there's this warmth and light coming out of the sun that's going to kind of engulf the silhouetted subject here. Much softer look. I think I'm going to, need to look at this from a, a bit of a distance, decide if I like it, but the idea is that we just make it brighter in the center, let it dissipate as it moves towards the left and right. And do so subtly, right? So the paint is just running out of my running off of my brush. It's becoming very watery as I run out of paint. So, stepping back, I actually really love that. If anything, we could do a little bit more. I'm going to hold off until we do the bottom of the painting, just to judge how much of a contrast I want up here. But I do like that effect. I do recommend it. And with that, we can move on to the next step in the painting. We are going to start moving down in the painting into our foreground. We're going to cover the greenery that we have on the left and right hand side. And this is going to be a little bit more high contrast than what we have in the background. It's going to have more of the innate coloring because we have less of that atmospheric light. I'm going to be using the larger flathead brush to mix and apply it initially because we have a large surface area to work with and we need a lot of paint to do so. I'm also going to make sure that the back of it has a hint of that purple that we used up here just to make a cohesive transition. And then by the bottom, we're going to move more into a green, which will have our sap green. Now, I did a little test mix here, and I realized that I really like what we had. So we're going to grab an abundance of our ultramarine blue, equal mixture of our cadmium red. As you can see, it makes a very dark pigment. We're going to interject some Mars black and titanium white to desaturate it a little bit. We don't need to in grand abundance, because the closer we get, the more saturated our subjects should be for the most part. And then I'm also going to grab some sap green, not a lot. Start by mixing in little bit by little bit, but this will also have an interesting effect as red and green will naturally desaturate each other. And we end up with a, a great pigment like that. Again, very similar. So I'm going to apply this right back here going to try initially to work 
around and in between my drawing. Though if I do not succeed, that is okay because we can always just redraw it. It's not a big deal. I know right now that I am actively going over portions of the more vertical rails. That's all right. I can still see where they are for the most part. And if I falter in one way or the other, I'd rather cover up portions of the other subjects than not enough of the grass. Because it's a lot easier to apply more of the grass color right now and then just paint over top of it than it is to have to go back after we paint this and this to go back to this pigment and then reapply it in the areas that we missed. So this just saves us some time. Now I'm going to move upwards and once I get to the point where we are at the water, I'm going to have this slight movement up. And then I'm going to make sure my brush is nice and damp. I'm going to have some little protrusions. You can also do this with your liner brush if you aren't confident with your ability to make sharp markings with this one. But this brush can make very sharp markings. You can see that a lot of these are pointing inwards just so we have that nice leading line effect. But occasionally, just to make sure that it's natural, we will have some that go out in the other direction as well. Sometimes they're going to be a lot higher than others. Creating that variance is important. Want them to be nice and thin for the most part. But again, we can also go back with our liner brush a little bit later and really build on all of that. That said, while this is still wet, and I do want to make sure that this layer right here is wet, so I'll just do a little bit more paint. We're going to grab our sap green, Mars black, a little bit of titanium white, a little bit of a blend with that purple. You're going to put that right around. the structures first and then I will do a blend of it up into the purple. And we'll also extend both pigments into here. and a little bit of that purple back into here. We just want a somewhat natural gradient from one color to the next. And if they're always a little bit blended, that's also great. You can barely tell the difference, but you do get that transition from the purple here to here and then into more of that innate green one would expect. So we'll also do a second layer. Just make sure it's nice and thick. Might need to let it dry before we go ahead and do so. That way we're not just ripping up pre-existing pigment. So let's head on over to the other side. So now moving on to the other side, we'll grab that same purple. And if we want, we can even start by rendering the taller protruding pieces. Last time we prioritized blocking in and getting some of that pigment off of our brush just because it can be difficult to apply pigment once you've just mixed with that same brush. You might have a, an abundance of it on there but as long as you clean off that abundance then you can go in and start with some details which in large part is what we are doing here. We want the tops of these to be sharp so I'm going in with as little pressure as possible and then I'm 
applying more pressure as I work downwards. And then once we have the majority of that top locked in, recognizing that we can go in with extra detail with a liner brush later on, I'm just going to fill this in nice and easy. I'm accepting that I'm just redrawing the, <laughs> the majority of the hand railings. That's okay. We'll leave the more prominent ones visual. At this point the pigment isn't so thin, definitely going to need more layers, but it is just helping me visualize what we're doing, where we're going with it. Here's a second layer for the top. You can see already looking better. Not amazing. We're not there yet, but it's definitely looking better. Second layer here. And honestly, if it doesn't look opaque by the second layer, do a third. Do a fourth. It's not a difficult application. Might as well get it just right. Right? There we are. Okay, now I'm going to switch over to the more green mixture. And I'm going to apply that, again, not touching the purple yet. We want to get as much pure green covering the canvas as we can in our negative space. And then once we have that, like we do now, then we commit to the blend. And if the purple has started to dry, we can always just apply more of that purple. Going back and forth between the pigments will probably lead to the best blend and rendering anyway. So we're just letting it dissipate as we work our way upwards for the most part. Doing multiple layers. Head back to our purple, do more up here. So taking a step back, our gradient is quite subtle, but I like that. Now it's time to grab the liner brush, which is our smallest brush point-wise, with the exception of the fan brush, but we get individual bristles there. Here we're going to have a controlled small application, so I'll grab some of that same pigment that I used for the top, and I'm going to start to tap on little details, little protrusions to these stems and branches and pieces of foliage. The idea is that we have the base done, and we did that with the larger flat-headed brush, and now we're going to really give it some life and offer the opportunity to also have some texture, some depth. That'll come as we really expand upon this application, but I wanted to show you what it looks like from far away just so you can see how small, how minute a lot of these markings are, but now I will get you a little bit closer. So, here we go. I'm going to start at the top with some fresh paint. The brush is damp so that I can get very small markings. It means our markings might be semi-transparent, but we do have a lot of Mars black in the mixture which will make the pigment quite thick anyway, so I don't really worry about it too, too much. But you can see that I'm following the pre-existing protrusions that we have, and I'm doing taps on the left, right-hand side, as well as sometimes on top, and I'm trying to make it all very inconsistent. That way, we have a consistent <laughs> evolution we, we work on it inconsistently to achieve some level of consistency in another regard, right? So it's taps. I might sometimes do three taps on the left-hand side, and then one on the right, or the other way around. We really just 
We want to make sure that no two portions look exactly the same beside each other. And that the left and right hand side of each of them don't look the same. Some of them can be more sparse than others. You can see I really elongated that one. Occasionally the pigment will be more transparent and that's okay, it just means more light. Looks like it's working through it. So don't worry about that either. You can also just let it dry and then go back over it again with another layer should you want a more opaque look. But once I just finalize a couple of these, I will pull the camera back so that you can see what both sides look like and the, the contrast. between the taps and just the line work. Because you could just do taller grass if you wanted to, but I do think this is a much more interesting look. So here we are, pretty dramatic difference, if I do say so, between these here. I'm definitely a fan of all of that texture. And, much like everything else you've done, after that first time, you kind of get a hang of it, you feel much more comfortable, and you can apply that pigment so much more quickly because you know how you're doing it. A lot of it's more so learning how to do it, and the amounts, the separation. It's not so much that the technique is laborious or it takes a grand amount of time, it's more so just figuring out how to do it, make it look best. And then once you have that understanding, you kind of double down and we can make it happen relatively quickly. But I'm still trying to make sure that they're different heights, they go in different directions, there's various amounts of opacities, they crisscross here and there. So many ways to make it unique. And that's what we're doing. We can also occasionally show portions of the, the stem or the body or that larger cluster of foliage. Sometimes they'll also overlap to a great deal and therefore create a, a larger area as well. We can also make some of them much taller. And I like to do that towards the edges because it creates a vignette effect. So here I'll expand dramatically. See that? Not tricky. And I like how it really bends in, acts as a leading line. Just like that. And then of course from there you can go back and expand however you'd like. I like how this kind of reaches up towards the sun. I think that's a, an interesting look which I want to mirror on this side, but I don't want to copy it because I think it would be too obvious. It wouldn't look natural. So we'll sit with it and we can always go back and add more a little bit later. Now from there, we'll get a little bit closer and we'll remix that same purple that we had. However, this time, we're going to interject a little bit more titanium white, just make it a hint brighter because we're going to have highlights on these from the light in the background. We're going to have some of that warmth work its way through. So I want a nice, somewhat brighter pigment. I want it to be a bit purple so it matches the other hues in the space, we we'll switch to our fan brush, make sure it's nice and damp so that we can essentially turn all of our little individual bristles into clusters, into clumps of them. So here instead of making, you know, 50 markings by tapping it with the dry fan brush, now we can make five or six. So we'll grab our pigment. And I'm going to start, we can add highlights 
because that's what this is. This is a highlight in comparison to our other markings. We can add this to our pre-existing areas, but then we go into the darker portions, and then we create more of these shapes down here. And we want them to overlap with what we already have at the top. And this will slowly transition into more of a green. We're also going to have them crisscross to a point. We need to make sure that they work their way under here as well. It's very dark. I think we can probably make it a hint brighter. Not too much. And we still do want that saturation. So when I interject that Mars black, I do want to add a little bit more red just to give it that life again. Going in with that damp fan brush. And at this point, I'm going to try to work on top of the previous markings that we already made. As to not visually overcomplicate the setting, the subjects. You can see just how quickly we're able to accumulate these subjects and markings. And a lot of them are moving up somewhat vertically with, of course, little bends to the left and right. Typically the bottom portion is the larger portion and then it gets taller or rather, as it gets taller, it gets smaller. And we'll bring that about to slightly past the middle point. And then we'll head on over to the other side. This is far from done, but we need to let it dry before we can really progress with it. So the other side here, it's not going to trick us. We know what we're doing. We're heading close to that top to begin with. We're creating those additional elongated markings, which are in large part connecting and overlapping with the top. Our taps will be much more dense and connected towards the top. And then as we get towards the bottom, we do want to space them out a bit more. And that's just because perspective, the way we're looking down at it, we'll see just more of the full subject as it gets closer to us. But it's okay if it looks sporadic. It's okay if we go over this here. We are going to paint that fairly soon. And we can just paint over these pigments with these, right? Not a big deal. So again, I'm only going to go to about here, but I am splashing in a couple random ones just to make it feel a lot more natural and lively. We can also double down on some on this side. Should we see an opportunity, we are still working with the same pigment. So it's nice and easy. Now from here, we're going to render a fairly desaturated green, but one that is definitely brighter than that which we had in the bottom corners. So with this one, we're using more gray, more sap green, and this might actually be a nice pigment to begin with. So I'm just going to make sure that my mixture is consistent. There aren't areas that are brighter or areas that are darker. And I'll switch over to our liner brush briefly, make sure it's nice and damp, grab some pigment, and then I'll go in Give it a try, and here is where we just interject a little potential stems, bodies, all of that into the painting. This is something that you can do before all of the purple applications, but I wanted to do it after so that I didn't overdo it. And I'm kind of just working this in between a lot of the openings. Occasionally they're crisscrossing. There's going to be a lot more down towards the bottom. They're going to be larger down towards the bottom as well. We are going to drag them 
off the canvas. And I'll get you closer for the other side. Now, despite the green being quite bright here, if you look at it right there up close, you notice that they're not all that similar. That's because we are using a damp brush. We have very transparent pigment. We have a very dark base. You put all of that together and you typically end up with something that's quite subtle. And that's great for a first layer. That's how we decide if we want to build. It's how we don't overcommit early on. But as you can see, just working the bottom in here. Try to hold the brush from farther back so I get a very unique stroke, especially at the bottom. You can bounce to the other side. Make a more watery mixture to get some that really glide on the canvas. Might be more transparent, but that's not an issue. And then we can also take this pigment and our fan brush, make sure that's nice and damp. That way we turn our fan brush into more of that fork-like aesthetic. And we can do some of these applications, but in green. I think it's the mixture of both that'll end up looking really nice as we continue to add pigment to this still somewhat void area. We are yet to do highlights, we're yet to do real details. We're still just placing in that foundation. And I'm also doing some of these markings, as you can see, horizontally. And that's just because we will have little leaves that protrude from some of these, right? And because we're adding more purple, we can apply these without worry that they all overlap the purple. We will fix the depth in that in additional layers. But then we can also do the same more reaching effect. They're smaller in the distance, they're larger in the foreground. And the goal is just to make it feel natural. So, from here, taking that step back again, we're going to remix the purple that we had, that we loved, and that was our ultramarine blue, our cad red. We had a fair amount of titanium white. I'm remixing it over the older purple that we had because I do want this to be brighter, a little bit more saturated. And the easiest way to make sure we do that is to have that direct comparison and contrast with the previous one. Now I am finding that I'm continuously having to go back and just add a lot more of these because of the amount of titanium white I'm needing to add to brighten it. So this mix definitely has a lot less Mars black. That's okay. Now we're going back to the fan brush. I did clean it so that it doesn't have any of the green. I am going to yet again make sure that it's nice and damp. Get that fork-like effect. More of a soft bristled fan brush effect than a a stiff, despite the fact that this is a stiff, it just works both ways. And then I'm going to start to tap on some highlighted protrusions to the pre-existing purple areas that we already have in the canvas. And 
We're going to start working it over some of our greenery in the foreground as well. And it'll really pop there because we still have that darker base. We're putting it on top of more greens than we are purples. And I know it's still very subtle. I'm trying to, <laughs> whenever I move the camera back like this, I always worry, oh, they won't be able to see, but it's kind of the point that you can't really see, right? It shows you just how subtle it is. That said, I'm just going to tap on a couple more of these and then I will get you closer as we get to a stage where it matters when we are close and you can see that detail. Right now I'm just tapping it on in the same way that we were before. Really nothing new to this application. So, closer and soon to be brighter. Now as we make this mixture brighter and brighter, I am going to lessen the amount of ultramarine blue slightly. We're going to make it a more cadmium red heavy mix. I still want that purple, but I just want it to be a little bit more pinkish purple than a bluish purple. So we can have it lean to one side while still incorporating the other. I'm trying to mix a good amount, I'm trying to mix it wide on the palette. This looks like it will be quite a bit brighter. However, we are still applying it over to a dark backdrop. So, we'll see. I'm going to start on the prominent one that I know I like. And I'm being fairly careful with this mixture because it is stark in comparison to that which we've had. So I'm not applying the entirety of the brush. At this point it's about a fifth. Sometimes I'm just using the singular little forking piece at the left hand side and it's only one. We'll need a lot up here because this is where the majority of the light is. Lots of taps and then we progressively get more into the individual ones and the unique form as we move down in the piece. And this is quite stark in relation to that which we've applied previously. However, and this should be noted, it's not really that stark of a pigment. It's not really that bright. It's not really that saturated. It's just that it is in comparison to everything else we have. And that's why we're not always just mixing on the palette thinking, oh, is this a bright pigment? Is this a saturated pigment? Because all of that needs to be considered in relation to what is already on the canvas. And then it's quite noticeable up close because again, we do have that very dark backdrop. We're not applying it over a green foundation. So we want our markings to be nice and sharp as they will be much more prominent through here. If we look at that side in comparison to that side, I think it's Evident, we're moving in the right direction. So, set over here, again, a lot of brighter pigments towards the top. Much more condensed in application, or a lot closer together. I think my brush might be a little too watery. The markings are quite large. You know what? Might actually be okay. If you do find your brushes too watery though, do just wipe it off on a little painting cloth. Get that extra pigment off there. And then go back in. It's not hard, it doesn't take long, and can render a 
much tighter, more intentional effect when you want it to be. Now this isn't something where we want all of these to be highly intentional. Sometimes you want that randomization factor. But we want the control, right? We want the ability to choose in those situations. So we're starting to build those nice brighter pigments. Let's yet again get even brighter. More titanium white, that will desaturate, so we need more cad red, we need more ultramarine blue. And I do want this to be a bit of a pink, but we are still retaining that blue. So put that down, pick up our fan brush yet again, and I am going to start with this pigment in the distance because it is even brighter and if it's dramatically so I want to ensure that we are initially getting the areas that are getting the most light. As you progressively move back and down all of these subjects will get significantly more shadows and we need to be aware of that. I'm going to do less towards the left and right hand side as well just because I don't want to draw the eye over there. And here I'm only really applying this initially to the tops of our protruding pieces and maybe the side a little bit. And my thought process here is that the tops are just going to be receiving more light than the bottom portions because they will cast shadows on themselves and each other. And this would just be a, a good way of going about it. Now, as always, we've done a bit from far away. Let's get you a bit closer. The difference between our two sides isn't that dramatic, but I think it's dramatic enough to show that an extra layer like this does do some real work. It is worth mixing up that pigment and going in yet again. So what is our rule? We start at the top when we work with these much brighter values. Try to make sure that we're not expanding upon our subjects too dramatically up here. We still want them to have those sharp edges and then as we work down we just apply it to the tops of a lot of our little protruding pieces I'm adding an extra little ones here and there. I don't completely follow the guidelines that I set with the previously applied protruding purple areas. Sometimes we do expand. And we can make that top much more dense because there will just be a visual greater abundance of them up there. There aren't really more, but because they're so compact in perspective, we'll get that feeling. Now that we did a lot over there, I think it's time we go back and we do more over here. We're taking away detail and that we're separating them less but it does help the piece because we don't need that detail and having more of a cohesive pattern driven subject will make it look better than the individuality of each protruding 
Szemek. Again, we step back to make sure that it all looks like it's coming together right. And I think we can make it even brighter. So I'm going to grab a lot of titanium white. There's a hint of Mars black in here that's consistently diluting it. And that is okay because I should be adding some Mars black. But here we're going for the brightest mix yet. Still want some saturation. I like this color a lot. And we're going to now apply it with our liner brush because we're at the point where we have the base of all of these and we just want to double down on the areas that we love, the areas that we feel like should really stand out and that means going in with a bit more of intentional mark making. So here I am going in and I'm tapping these individually where we used to get five or six at the same time with the goal of brightening, adding form. We want there to be progressively less light as we move towards us. So we'll do less of it as we move towards us. We're doing less of it as we move towards the left hand side. That said, as always, Let's get you closer. So going into this, we're going to grab a good amount of paint. We're going to head up to the top here. And while I want to spend a lot of time at the top, really working my way across because all of these areas need that abundance of light, I am going to just move down quickly to show you really what we're aiming to build here. I'll do it on this side, picking the tops of some of my favorite pieces and working down. Just like so. We're not doing it to all of them, but we'll probably add just a hint of that highlight to the tips of all of them that are at least in the top half of our section here. And they stand out kind of an odd way until we go back up to the top here and we reinstigate those highlights because these are the ones that make the lighting scheme and the painting all work together, right? So this is pretty imperative. You'll probably be like me. I think a lot of us will be and that will want to dive into the more detailed areas and have fun intentionally placing it there, but we do also need to be spending time in the top. Like so. And then we can work our way down. And we'll add hints down here, but not much. Brush is fairly watery at this point, so it's going to be a lot more transparent, which is good, because that means it'll be more subtle. And this is something we can spend a lot of time on, or a little bit, depending upon how much highlight you want to add. Look at that side in comparison to that side, makes a big difference. So here we are jumping over again, grabbing a lot of that clean pigment and we can start with a more cathartic process of finding more dramatic protrusions, building on them as we do, letting it dissipate as we work towards the bottom of each. And that just means our taps get lighter and they get more sparse. We're at the top. 
we have some level of pressure, not too much because we don't want to expand the bristles of the brush. But there is certainly more. And we just let it become softer and softer. That's it. Back up to the top and making sure that we have these nice highlighted details. I think this side actually is naturally a bit brighter than this side. We just did more with highlights over here than we did on the other side for the most part. So this would be easier than the other side. And by easier, I just mean it'll take less time because at no point is this technique really a, a challenging one. It's more of just a cathartic find the areas you like and add extra highlights. But it won't take as long. Said so still doing less on the edges, little bits here and there. So, taking this step back yet again, I'm very happy with the progression from light to dark, not so dense applications to very dense applications, larger applications to smaller applications, and as you can see, I've gone ahead and redrawn in all of the individual pieces for our little walkway here. I'm going to start with a mid value, and I'm going to continue to work with pigments that are akin to that which we've already used. I want it to be cohesive, so we're just beginning by mixing up a mid-value purple, and for ease's sake, we're also going to grab some raw umber for the first time here. It's a lot like burnt umber, but you could say it's a little bit more green in hue. So here, now we have this nice purplish brownie pigment. And initially, I like to work on the edges, right? Because that's when we have the best opportunity to render a nice sharp marking. So I'm trying to do that. I'm trying to do that with elongated brush strokes to a point. Trying to make it relatively straight, though this is made up of individual boards, so it doesn't have to be perfect. And I actually just have a little too much paint on my brush to get a very articulate stroke, something that's done with real intention. So I'm actually going to get the majority of the pigment off of my brush here and just apply it to the larger body because it's been difficult to get a sharp, straight marking. Here I don't have much paint left on my brush, so. At this point, it's getting easier. And now I can kind of fill in those side portions, get all of the areas in between. Remember that this is made out of wood, so it is a well crafted and organic subject. So having little imperfections is actually a good thing, and it's just the base layer. We're going to be adding a lot of pigment on top of it. So, right now, what matters is just building that base. After I apply a lot of these pigments, even though they're going to be, as you can see, done through angles, like this, is another way of doing it. Just because I'm going in this direction, doesn't mean I'm going to stay in that direction. Now I'm going to try to pull out of that pigment back towards the center, because if these brush strokes are seen later on, if they're still visually present in later layers. I want them to be horizontal because that's the movement that we see in the wood, the wood grain, all of that. So I'm trying to be quite intentional with the last strokes being across the canvas. Right now you can see that it's quite reflective, especially through here. The pigment's quite a bit darker and it will dry darker, but for now, it's just going to look a hint brighter. Just 
I'm gonna grab some extra water. We don't really want to thin it too much because we want a thick application, but it really can help. We just keep inching closer here so you can see a little bit better, but I'm actually going to make this mixture a little bit more of our raw umber for the second layer. You don't have to do a second layer, but I do want it to be a bit more thick. And here yet again I did that mix, so I'm just getting the majority of the initial pigment off my brush. This is a layer we don't want to be too dark or too light, that way we can build highlight and shadow on top of it. There we go. Now I found an angle with the camera that makes this not super reflective, so hopefully you can see that. It's natural hue and value well. From here I'm going to go in and I'm going to start crafting the railings. And I'm going to do so with small little taps. I'm trying not to do longer ones right here just because when you do sometimes you can incorporate an arch in your mark making and I just want mine to be fairly straight again it doesn't have to be absolutely perfect just by virtue of the subject we are rendering but I think that extra care will go a long way and then once I start to run out of paint I just work in between because I don't have to be as delicate in that area. But I will grab more pigment before repositioning for the edge. And it's also worth noting that, again, we talked about it at the start of the lesson, but if you would like help with the drawing process, making sure that all of this is exactly as it should be, you can find the traceable which you can print out and use a tracing paper or use a mini projector or any of those other techniques to get this on your canvas. You can find that up over on Patreon. You can also find the reference photo, which I admittedly took a lot of artistic liberties with. Dramatic changes, but I am a big believer in artistic liberties when they can greatly aid a painting. Sometimes you just want to change the mood or atmosphere. Big, big believer that that can be extremely beneficial. and you can also make it fun, right? You get to interject more of yourself, make it unique. A lot of benefits there. But again, the traceable is up over on Patreon. Where you can also get a lot of bonus lessons. Right now we're working on a 24 by 36 inch canvas in multiple parts. We've been working on it for a couple of weeks. There are, I think, four episodes up right now. But if you like working on these lessons, but you want to work on a larger canvas, there are a couple of series up there that are much larger. You can also get access to my eBooks, which includes acrylics for beginners, which essentially teaches you everything you need to know about painting with acrylics. There are also ebooks full of traceables for those uninspired days. Sometimes I upload additional reference photos. You can get access to our exclusive Facebook group where everybody shares their artwork, their renditions of these pieces. So you get to see other unique ways of adding and building onto it ask questions with the rest of the community. It's a really positive, supportive place. A lot of incredible, not, not only art, but like incredible people. I just like wonderful people up there who are actively engaging in, you know, learning and getting better together. I try to step in when I can and 
say hello, look at the look at the pieces, offer help where I where it's requested. There are also full art critiques up there at higher tiers and you can also get your name at the end of all of these videos. So there's a, a lot of perks and bonuses on top of the reference photos and traceables, extra lessons, ebooks, all of that. If you're interested, check it out, but with that, I think I'm quite happy with the base layer that we've built here. We do, we do need to add a lot of highlights, we need to add a lot of texture, we are just getting started, but it's a good base. Now from here, let's start building some highlights. We'll grab titanium white, a little bit of that cad red, ultramarine blue, and we can go with more of a purple highlight, especially in the background. So I'm not interjecting the raw umber quite yet, but I'm going to take the majority of this pigment off my brush. I'm going to make a relatively watery mixture, that way it's semi-transparent. And I'm just going to make these scraping marks around the back of the wood. Now, as you can see, as I do so, I am creating little lines. My brush doesn't have a lot of pigment, it isn't perfect strokes. So right now we're essentially creating this texture that will run its way across all of these boards. I want to, as we get closer to us, have it get a little bit wider. So I'm not making as many strokes so close together. And I'm also going to start randomly applying these more so in the center. It isn't always going to be straight across, though straight across is also great. We want more of them towards the middle because we also will have a little bit of that reflection working its way down here. And this is only application number one of texture. We will build it up over time, trying to make portions of this feel nice and unique. So there's occasionally just little taps as well. But so many, soft watery markings right now. You don't want to build up too much water because then the paint doesn't stick. You just kind of continuously rip it up off the previous layers. But here we have that right amount. And I do recommend just playing with it until you do get that right amount. Then, then you go in for the real applications. Now what you might hear in the background are some very neat planes. We have the air show this weekend here in Toronto, and they've been flying around outside during lunch. It's uh, it's been pretty cool. Growing up, my family would always take me to the uh, the local air shows and get to go inside the planes and see all of the the fun tricks. So it's pretty nostalgic for me. I really like it. I know some people don't love the sounds, but I think I think there's a lot of good there. That wasn't a plan. <laughs> the motor vehicles are now competing for who can make the most sound. Though I suppose that isn't really a new thing, is it? So far, I like all of that. We're going to take the same pigment. We're going to apply it to the top of this railing and we'll do it on both sides build that up make it fairly opaque
and then we'll also do it on the part of these that faces inwards because they're going to catch more light than the ones that are facing backwards towards us. And this is true for both sides. However, on the left hand side, or rather on the right hand side, we're painting it on the left hand side of the actual pieces, where on the left hand side, we're painting it on the right hand side of the pieces. It's a convoluted sentence, but I think you know what I mean. It's always just the area that is pointing inwards. We can also take some of that extra pigment, rework it into the middle now that it's started to dry. It's not too watery, not too wet. We'll apply a good amount to the back there. Now we'll take our Mars Black, Ultramarine Blue, Cad Red, Hint of Titanium White will make up a much darker mixture with an emphasis on blue. We want this to be a bit cooler than warmer, so we still have the red in there, but it's not to the same abundance, and this can be one of the darkest pigments we've rendered yet. I'm going to head in, and I'm going to start separating some of the boards that this is comprised of. And I'm doing so through this tap and drag effect. Some areas are going to be more open than others, so occasionally I'm pressing harder with my brush, where other times I'm applying next to no pressure. These boards aren't going to be perfect. So variance isn't a bad thing. And as we get farther away from us, we're going to make them more condensed. So they're going to start getting closer and closer together. We're also going to want our markings to get smaller and smaller. As we run out of paint, we're going to have less opaque markings, which is also great, as we want it to get more subtle. Now I do need to grab more pigment, I'm going to make it very watery, and I'm going to take the initial pigment off in areas that we've already established, that way when we go back to this, we don't have anything dramatic. And at this point, it's just implications. Again, you can retransfer the reference photo if you want to make it absolutely perfect. Like that. Okay, now, we'll put this brush down temporarily. We'll pick up our liner brush and we'll incorporate some little knots, holes and textures within our wood. A lot of it's going to come initially towards the sides and the edges. It's very watery. I'm applying next to no pressure with my brush. A lot of these textures are going to happen more so towards the foreground and us initially. Just because we'll be able to see more detail on subjects that are closer.
Really want to go back to the flowers and all of that on the edge. We'll do that quite soon. Right now we're just putting in a little bit of texture, a little bit of extra movement, very watery mix. We can even do tiny taps. which initially visually will stand out greatly to you because they are the only tapping motion and it's new to us, but it's one of those things where once you apply, you take those steps back, you give it a little bit of time, it'll feel really natural. You won't really notice them. They'll just subtly, subconsciously add to the piece. Now we're going to switch yet again to a different brush, that being the smaller flathead. And I'm going to take this darker hue and incorporate it towards the back of these posts. Probably just the first three or four. And I'm not covering the entirety of the area, I'm just letting it visually interact, be a part of the setting. That way we have those darker hues, those darker values rather in between the boards elsewhere. So it just feels a lot more cohesive this way. Structure makes more sense. We can also add just a hint of it towards us over here. Do a little blend. Just let it softly transition. Then we can do some little lines, should we want to, in the larger opening areas, much like we did here, but with this brush instead. You can switch back to the liner brush, but I felt like this one would do the job fairly well. And then I'm also going to take this, and then just, with a very watery mix, work it along my edges towards the center. This will give us slightly more dimension and again have the portions in the middle just match something else well. We're not looking to outline it, We're really not looking to outline it. We're just trying to give the area a little bit of a silhouette in general. So stepping back, love the amount of texture we have in there, love the progression. It is drying quite a bit darker. I'm okay with that. If we wanted it to be brighter, we could just go back over it again with the larger flathead and just re-instigate those highlights. You could also make them a little bit more of that pinkish purple. However, we are now going to head in and extend some of this to overlap and go in between these. It'll add a lot of detail, a lot of dimension, so let's, uh, let's have some fun with it. So we're going to start by remixing some of the purples that we initially had, which, as you probably remember, are a little bit more red dominant than they are blue dominant. Though we do still need the blue. We still need a little bit of Mars black, not much, and an abundance of titanium white. We can render different variants of this, so we can bounce back and forth between colors, which means some areas will be a little bit more red, some areas can be a bit of that purple. But now we switch back to the smaller liner brush, grab that pigment, and I'm going to want to find areas that looked like they were pre-existing pieces of our flowers like this, and then we just layer those on top and over. The edges of our walkway here. And we'll do a lot more towards the back and just kind of let it engulf portions That means going on top, 
as well as through the sides. And multiple layers will help us build that up nicely. If there are any portions that you don't love, this is a great easy way to kind of cover those up a little bit. But we are going to find lots of little areas to build on and just make it all feel nice and cohesive. Like it fits together, right? That's the big goal here. Make it all the same landscape subject. Just make it fit. like this one a lot. We painted quite a few of these, so at this point it should come fairly naturally. We'll definitely need a more titanium white heavy mixture to build highlights and all of this. But right now, in so many times that we've done before, we are building a foundation. And that we can build upon. Sometimes you're working on much taller ones. Sometimes they're quite low. And then occasionally we can just have little pieces that are blown off and sitting on the wood. Should get smaller as we get into the distance. So they're just minute taps. Not much pressure with the brush at all. And then the foreground we do apply a bit more pressure. Going to go over a couple of them a number of times, the larger ones, just because we want them to be opaque. Like that a lot. Now, yet again, Stepping back, we are going to mix an even brighter variant of our pink. This time I'm just starting with a cad red and titanium white. Then I'm adding a very small amount with the corner of my brush of our ultramarine blue. An even smaller amount of Mars black. We'll get a good mix between those. Switch over to, you guessed it, the liner brush, which will make nice and damp. And from there, we'll throw highlights onto the areas we just applied. Because they were watery and we have a dark base, they likely ended up a lot darker than when we applied them, at least what we had on our palette. So this is our opportunity to build those up and make it all feel nice and cohesive. I'm also doing a number of these that go up and over our wooden portions. We can have some that kind of sit on the top of these as well. They don't all need to be just on the ground. Trying to make them at different heights on opposite sides though. And we're going over a number of these a couple of times until we build them up to the point where they stand out in the way that we want them to. They have that opacity that makes them look great. It was one of those things where we go in initially with very little and we have that less is more approach. Over time, we build and 
we end up with something that we really love. Towards the end of a lot of these lessons, I like to give you a little keyword, something you can use in the comments. You can either use it as part of a sentence or just type the word, but it essentially notes that you are part of the, on average, 13% who make it to the end of the video. It's a little badge of honor, and it's a subtle way of saying, hey, I dedicated the time, I listened to the entirety of the lesson, and I'll know, everybody else who got to this point will know, but only the people who got to the end will know. That's the fun part about it, it's a subtle little note. So today, instead of doing a word, I think we'll do a little phrase, and that's final days of summer, or final day of summer. You could just type that in the comments, noting that perhaps this looks like it, or you can tell me about your final days of summer, how you like to spend them, what you like to look at, maybe a memory. Always find that really fun to go a little bit deeper with it, and just explore what everybody's thinking. So, final days of summer is the key term. And I'd also just like to say, take this minute, to say a big thank you to A, everybody watching for being here, but also, in big part, big thank you to everybody up over on the Patreon page. It is because of you that I'm able to take the time to make these longer lessons, put them on YouTube, and release them in the way that we do. If it wasn't for you and your support in no world, would I be able to do what I do for a living and make these? And, and this is all really because of you. So thank you for this opportunity. Thank you for supporting me, supporting this channel, making all of this happen. I, uh, I don't think I'll ever be able to say enough thank yous for this opportunity because I love doing what I do and I just I appreciate all of you greatly for making it happen. That said, I will continue to try to give you the best lessons I possibly can and give you a lot of extra content up on the Patreon as well. Again, I, uh, I just uploaded episode 4 of our large 24 by 36 inch piece, so if you haven't checked that out yet, you can do so now, as we are just including this. And again, if you're new here, you can find the, the traceables, the ebooks, all of that good stuff, bonus lessons. But, but really, <laughs> really thank you. It was such a pleasure to work on this. And I hope you guys all feel inspired and excited and ready to go out and create your own rendition, something that you are proud of and excited about. I feel like I can just stay here all day and tap on these little applications, but it's really was a pleasure. I will see you next week with another lesson. So if you haven't already, hit the subscribe button, but more importantly, hit the little notification bell at the bottom. That way, YouTube will let you know when the next lesson is out. I've been painting a lot lately. I intend to continue painting a lot, like we have been, and very soon fall will be here which means fall lessons and fall colors and all of that fun as well. I'm really looking forward to it. Seeing what we, what we come up with together. But with that, thank you for being here. Thank you for your time. Thank you to all of the support. And we'll see you soon. So above all, <laughs> And uh, as always, you stay creative. You enjoy, you relax. And by the way, don't forget to uh, have a little water break here and there. Have a little bit of food. I try to mention in every lesson, I don't know that I did this one, but it is a friendly reminder. 
We need sturdy hands when we're painting detail, and if we're not eating, we're not drinking, we're probably a little bit shaky, makes it a little bit harder, so just make sure you're taking care of yourself. Make sure you're being healthy. I know that it's really easy to lose yourself in a painting for hours on end, and that's a, an amazing thing to be that inspired and dedicated, and you know, but do make sure you're taking care of yourself too. That matters. And uh, again, I will see you next week with a brand new painting lesson. Take care.